Oh, there, Skeptic Squids. In part one, which you can find by either clicking the card or following the link down below, I discuss some of the factual inaccuracies in Riddle's video. And today, we will be discussing the horrible physics in that video. So enjoy! As of filming, Riddle's original video was taken down by a copyright strike. It seems they used 3D assets or stock footage that do not belong to them. That is speculation on my part. I do have the original footage however. I'm just gonna blur it and put a notice over it so that I don't get flagged by whoever flagged their video. If the world's most powerful nuclear device is set off at this spot, the shockwave from the blast, reinforced by the hydrostatic effect... A tiny bit of truth mixed in with a whole lot of nonsense. Water is basically incompressible, and obviously much denser than air. That means, in an explosion, it takes more energy to move water out of the way than to move air out of the way. That means that it will impart more energy into the crust, if the explosion is on the water instead of in the air. The problem is that the crust is obviously much much more denser, so either way most of the energy has disappeared into the water instead of into the crust. If you want to import the maximum amount of energy into the crust, you need to bury the bomb kilometers underneath the ground. ...will produce a tremendous downward force precisely at the location of one of the lithospheric weak spots, the junction of tectonic plates. I've actually never heard of the term lithospheric weak spots before. And honestly, there are better places to detonate the bomb. Convergent plate boundaries are associated with extreme crustal thickening. You have two masses colliding. They buckle. They get thicker. That would make sense. Also, divergent boundaries are being pulled apart, so they're naturally thinner. Mid-ocean ridges, and to a lesser extent, transverse boundaries. These would be better places to detonate the bomb. But don't for a second think Anything is going to happen. Spoiler alert, nothing is going to happen. As a result, the plates will start either converging or diverging very quickly, and either option spells trouble for humankind. So you're saying that either the force is strong enough to literally push the plates apart, or weaken the, the boundary enough so that plate tectonics can speed up, as in runaway subduction. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure Dr. Baumgartner would be pretty interested in that. In fact, I'm pretty sure he'll be quite proud if you could manage such a thing. And uh, an astonishing discovery was made. Run away. But, uh, look, there just isn't enough energy in the Tsar bomb to do that. And I'll prove that later. So, if the bomb explodes at or near the bottom, we're not going to get away with just a really big splash. If my calculation in the previous video is correct, and it is, there's not going to be any splash. No amount of splash. Not even a tiny amount of splash. None. None. What do you think, Lamar? Do you think there'll be a splash? You see, that's the face of no. At the depth you want the explosion to take place, it's not even going to breach the surface. The only thing it's going to do is make a bunch of whales quite sad. The energy received at the base will be transferred to the boundaries of the tectonic plates at the speed of sound. Part of that energy will be reflected back up from the bottom of the trench to be liberated at the surface in the form of a colossal ultra super tsunami. You're wrong on so many levels. In my previous video, I proved why you won't get a massive tsunami at the surface. You say that the energy is transferred through a rock at the speed of sound. Did you know that the speed of sound is dependent on the medium through which the wave propagates and that it's proportional to the density of that medium? Pfft, well, of course you didn't know that. You're saying that as if that makes the bomb somehow have more energy. Look, you can transport energy through a medium and break the laws of physics a thousand times quicker. It's still just a set amount of energy, a tiny amount of energy at that. So, Nothing's gonna happen. Only this time, 
the tsunami will be just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Next, we'll see massive magnitude 12 earthquakes occur across the entire ring of fire. A magnitude 12 earthquake? On what scale? I mean, the Richter scale only goes up to 10 for conventional earthquakes caused by plate tectonics. And the largest magnitude earthquake ever recorded was in 1960 Vidalvia, Chile. It measured 9.6 on the Richter scale. It's a, it's a pretty serious earthquake if you ask me. It's not impossible to get higher than 10 on the Richter's magnitude scale. It's just not possible with conventional plate tectonics. The Chicxulub impact event is said to have created an earthquake of about 13 on the Richter's magnitude scale. And that one made most of the dinosaurs quite depressed. It's also possible that it's using the moment magnitude scale. With tiny bit of math, we can calculate the earthquake that will be produced by the Tsar bomb in the moment magnitude scale. We can also then go further and calculate what bomb would be required to make a local earthquake of 12 on the moment magnitude scale. So, like I said, using this little equation right here, inputting the proper values, as you can see, the Tsar bomb would create a magnitude 7.1 earthquake, which is already quite a bit less than 12 on the moment magnitude scale. If we then go further increase the yield to 5 petatons of TNT, yeah, that's 5,000 teratons of TNT, we get a magnitude 12 earthquake. Here's the main problem though. In any conventional nuclear explosive, even if it's completely underground, only a tiny amount of the energy is converted into seismic waves. So quite clearly, this is utter nonsense. Which will then give rise to a second installment of mega uber tsunamis even higher than before. So what you're saying is that the Earth's crust is going to amplify the waves. <laughs> Look, if that was the case, conventional earthquakes and rather large earthquakes would have destroyed the entire Earth a long time ago. We'll next be treated to a gargantuan release of magma back at the area of the explosion. And this will set off a chain of volcanic eruptions to complete the picture. Wait, are you seriously implying that that explosion is going to punch a hole through hundreds of kilometers worth of crust. Lest these survivors in the highlands assume they've been given a lucky break. This volcanic activity will continue for at least a month. Suppose a giant volcanic outburst did occur. It wouldn't just affect the entire earth for like one month. It would affect it for several months, like years even. Mount Tambora explosion it was a huge event. And that made the entire earth quite, quite sad for an entire year. So expect the Earth to be assaulted with seemingly endless acid rain, while the airborne ash will interfere with air travel needed for humanitarian missions, in addition to blocking out much of the light from the sun. To me, that smells an awful lot like nuclear winter, or at the very least, a couple of very cold years. No, but in the space of a few seconds, you go from a few months to years, so you underestimate and overestimate at the same time. I mean, that's that's actually quite impressive, to be honest. There's also the possibility that a Tsar Bomba type explosion at a depth of roughly 1.5 miles or two and a half kilometers from the bottom of the Mariana Trench could punch a hole in the Earth's crust, sufficient to produce a magma fountain. <laughs> so he seriously is implying that that tiny little explosion is going to punch a hole through hundreds of kilometers of solid rock. Solid rock. Do you see this little scar on Earth's surface? That's the Fridaford Dome. An impact scar of an object about 15 kilometers in diameter. It is literally the biggest impact event in the last 2 billion years and even that could punch a hole through Earth's crust. The fountain would then form a new continent while also bringing about the same tsunamis and environmental problems previously discussed. I don't even know what to say, it's just too stupid. In addition, the tremendous impact could push the planet very slightly out of its current orbit. This will either bring us closer to the sun, where we'll thoroughly fry, with dear old Earth turning into something like a second Venus. Or, on the contrary, the impact might move our orbit further out, where we would descend into a kind of permanent winter. Again, a tiny grain of truth in our ocean of nonsense. Earthquakes 
can affect Earth's rotation slightly. The huge earthquake that struck Japan in 2011 was a magnitude 9 on the Richter scale. It actually quickened Earth's orbit. It made the days shorter by 2 microseconds. The Zarbo explosion in the 1960s did nothing. And just because you're buried in the ground doesn't mean it's going to make it any more better. It's still just going to do that. Nothing. Finally, there's the possibility that so powerful an explosion at the location of a tectonic fault will simply tear the planet itself apart. The fate of humankind in that scenario is easy to see. The gravitational binding energy of Earth is about 2 times 10 to the power of 32 joules. The explosive yield of the Tsar bomb is 210 times 10 to the power of 15 joules. You're going to need about this number of bombs to destroy the Earth Death Star style. You know, that, that, that's what you're gonna get. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh good luck with that. Fortunately, however, the likelihood of any of the above happening is extremely low. And that is the third accurate fact of this entire video. And that is that none of this is possible. None of it. So you're probably wondering how much energy is released during an earthquake and how it compares to a czar bomb. The seismic moment of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake is estimated to be about around more or less 3.9 times 10 to the power 22 joules. This represents the total energy output of the earthquake. Using a bit of maths, it would mean that it would take around 185,714 Tsar bombs to equal the power output of that earthquake. And that's only accurate if 100% of the energy is transferred into the crust, which we know it's not. Only about 0.5% of an atomic bomb's energy, just blown up inside the crust, is transferred as seismic waves. So you skeptic squids might be thinking, Dan, if it takes that much explosive power to create an earthquake, why don't you just use your nearly 190,000 Tsar bombs and just destroy the entire planet. And you'll be correct. Air blasting those bombs is where it's at. That's where you're going to get the maximum amount of energy. Or maximum amount of destructive energy. To destroy the civilization. You'll be wasting your time to create a little earthquake. That's for sure. The total seismic energy imported onto Japan. Equals to about 0.9 times a czar bomb. So it would be more effective to just destroy a place with the bomb itself and not try to create some earthquake. That sort of feels wrong to say. Julius Trevor, which you should totally check out by the way, pointed out that it seems like Riddle is saying that the actual canyon is 11 kilometers deep from the start of the canyon to the bottom, instead of actually the start of the sea level down to the bottom. From the start of the canyon, or we should rather say from the relative uh, depth of the abyssal plain surrounding it, it says that the canyon is about 5 kilometers deeper than that. So, I mean, maybe they're saying that? It's a bit vague. Another actual error they have is that they say that the wideness of the trench is about 3 miles wide, or about 5 kilometers. It's actually 65 or 69 kilometers in, in, in width. That's an average one, of course. On another note, the maths I did in my previous video is actually sort of more or less correct. A commenter of mine gave me a little paper where they did some of the calculations regarding some nuclear explosions. There's all sorts of evidence in there from waves being made, from death of craters being made. Super interesting paper. And following some of the calculations there, or equations as you rather say, putting in my own values, uh, I'm gonna put something on the screen here, this is how their graph looks like. If I input the values from the Tsar bomb and then use my equation and put the same values, I get that my equation gives me 26 meter high wave at about 7 kilometers out. In their equation I get about a 10 meter high wave. That means my equation is about 16 meters out. I mean, it's, it's pretty damn close. I mean, come on, what's 16 meters? <laughs> what? I mean, what's 16 meters between friends and anyways? Uh, well, well, listen, the point still stands. Riddle is completely wrong, and I'm right, 
even though their equation is more correct. I'm still... My math is still good, okay? Shut up! Another last interesting fact that atomic explosions have been performed underground and the effects have not only been recorded at the time of the explosion but before and after the explosion for years actually. And from the initial explosion a seismic energy was calculated or measured and subsequent aftershocks was measured as well. That was literally earthquakes underneath the ground. Long after the explosive, well, the detonation took place. That literally means that the explosion did weaken some tectonic fault lines and slippage did occur. The only problem was that this explosion was a one megaton explosion. Pretty damn big. Maybe not czar bomb level, but it's still pretty damn big. And even that only caused several tiny tiny earthquakes. Earthquakes that could be measured by seismometers but not fell. And seismometers are extremely sensitive equipment. What I'm trying to say is that they're wrong. Riddle is wrong. That bomb is not going to do anything what they say. They're wrong. Okay? Yeah. Well, this is the end of the video as well. Thank you so much for watching. And believe it or not, this is the second time I'm recording this entire video. The first time I recorded and my microphone. <laughs> it wasn't plugged in. Uh, uh, yeah, it's one of those things sometimes happens, but here I am recorded again. <sighs> Anyways, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you really enjoyed this video, uh, well, go watch the first one as well. If you haven't, because this is sort of awkward, you ready at the end of this video, you should watch the first one. Regardless, please do the liking thing, like it. Um, Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Yet. Also, please comment, give some feedback. Comments are always nice, and you know the most important part. Enjoy the rest of your day, skeptic squids. <laughs>